when we imagined this uh, one day um, uh, symposium on wildlife crime, we, uh, we tried to think of who would be the best person in the world to talk about this agenda situated in the larger worldwide effort around endangered species and the name Richard Leakey came up and um, we thought bringing one of the world's most uh, noted paleontologists and experts and advocates for um, humane treatment of wildlife um, to this campus would be a great coup. We had no idea we were going to get two of the world's greatest paleontologists. His uh, wife Maeve Leakey has also joined him. Um, we're not going to make you work for your lunch, um, but uh, Dr. Leakey will. Um, everyone in this room knows his uh, credentials, uh, and they were all listed on our website and also on the advertising materials. I'm just going to say a couple of things. Um, he was uh, born in Kenya in 1944 to uh, two uh, of the world's leading paleontologists and was disinterested in that field for a while in, until his life was changed by doing some work with them. Uh, and his life was changed again uh, in the pioneering work in the Turkana Basin uh, and the 1.6 million year old skeleton of the Turkana boy for which he gained worldwide uh, notoriety. Um, at the age of 24, it's a shocking thing, he was uh, named director of the Museum of Kenya and held that post uh, for 21 years when he then became director of the Kenya Wildlife Service. Um, in that work, he became known worldwide for his advocacy for um, saving endangered species, in particular elephants. Uh, and you've all seen the burning of the uh, 12 tons of confisc confiscated ele elephant tusks. That was his doing. And in, in that one galvanizing moment, the world became aware uh, of the multiple kinds of problems related to elephant poaching. And that act alone um, uh, interfered with the elephant poaching trade uh, for some time. It has since come back. Um, he um, lost his legs in, a, in an airplane crash that ha had suspicious um, roots and that was probably related to his political work uh, in, in Kenya where he was uh, involved in Kenyan politics, was Secretary General, General of the Kenyan Opposition Party, Safina, and was elected to the uh, Kenyan Parliament in 1999 and he became the um, uh, head of the Kenya Civil Service in, uh, in 2001. Um, he is a distinguished professor at Stony Brook University where he leads the, uh, um, uh, uh, the annual um, Stony Brook World Environmental Forum and Human Evolution, Evolution Symposia. Uh, he's co-authored over 100 scientific books and articles. Uh, he, you've seen him on uh, several documentaries uh, about, um, uh, about uh, the human species and about animal species. Uh, Time Magazine named him one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. It is really an honor to welcome Dr. Richard Leakey to our campus. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. And <clears throat> I wasn't sure I was going to be here myself. I've been rather unwell recently with a liver failure. <clears throat> and I was waiting to have a transplant, but it's been delayed to later in the year. So I accepted not really thinking I'd have to keep the appointment. <laughs> but I was, yeah, I'm feeling much better, and so we came down. It's um, no longer an active part of my life, dealing with wildlife crime, but I do, behind the scenes, maintain contact with the law enforcement and thinkers around conservation issues in Africa, particularly East Africa and very specifically in Kenya. And through that I keep in touch with some of the more global issues that we have to look at. And one of the things that has struck me increasingly is every species that's threatened is threatened for different sorts of reasons. And we can't come up with a one-size solution that will fit everything. And listening to the discussion about fish, parrots, what I know about elephants and rhino, there are parallels. And if one were to draw um, the most obvious parallel, I think it's the lack of awareness on the part of the consumer 
of illegal species that's causing us the trouble. Uh, clearly, many of the people who are buying parrots in South America are unaware that the parrot is endangered. Many people buying ivory were unaware that the elephant was killed illegally. Many people who go to the pharmacy in the Far East to buy traditional medicine made from rhino horn have no idea that the rhino is endangered. Uh, certainly, <coughs> fishing, uh, commercial fishing, the restaurant. Uh, my wife is more aware of the fishing situation, or was, than I am, but um, we're both friends of Sylvia Earle, and I made, uh, made a date to have dinner with her in Washington some years ago, and I've never enjoyed fish again. <laughs> Which is a good thing, but I was totally, absolutely unaware of the extent of the damage that is being done in restaurants in Western and Eastern countries. Of course, it's a, it's a small part of the human population because the vast majority of people who eat fish in the littoral areas of the, of the world don't go to restaurants to get it, but they're not the people I think we're really talking about. So having said ignorance is probably the most crucial issue, I think the other issue that we often forget is poverty. And I think the expectation that people in very different uh, circumstances to those of most of us in this room today are willing to give up the opportunity to put their child through school because an animal is cuddly or because it might become extinct is, is, is pretty naive in this day and age where everything is costing more and more and more and more. And we send out um, people to combat armed poachers who are coming in after elephant and rhino in our national parks. And the people we're sending out are earning, you know, $500 a month. The people who are in possession of 10 elephant tusks have at least $10,000 in their hand. And you can share some of that and you can bypass the law. And so I think poverty is something we've got to take much more seriously than we do. And I don't think, particularly in, in Western countries, there's any appreciation of the fact that if you have no access to funding, you have no access to security in terms of your family's health, in terms of uh, your children's education, and certainly in terms of your own old age and, and, and needs after you turn um, 60, 70. And now with the pressure to have smaller families to sustain fewer numbers, uh, the expectation of those families is much higher than it used to be. And I think we're in, in, a, in an interesting spiral that a lot more work needs to be done on. But certainly, as far as I'm concerned, consumer education, addressing poverty, are two of the most critical things. With regards to <laughs> the situation, let's say specifically with elephant that I engaged in when I founded and led the first Kenya Wildlife Service, it was a, I suppose in a way it was a, 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 a memory of the fact that when I was a boy, spotted cats, ocelot, cheetah, leopard from the tropics were hugely threatened as a result of fur coats. And the trade in fur of spotted cats was rampant and whereas it used to be very common to see leopard in, in the suburbs of Nairobi. They suddenly disappeared completely. And it turned out that there was this massive trade. And I remember specifically being struck by the fact that at that time, quite a famous um, French star, Brigitte Bardot, was better known to 16-year-old boys for her love not of cats, but 
the excitement she gave 16-year-old boys, because she was the first person to take off all her clothes in a magazine. Um, she gathered together as many spotted skins as she could, and she had a big bonfire in Paris, and brought to the attention of many of the fashion houses and many of the fashionable women from New York to Toronto to Paris, across to, to parts of Asia and, and further, further east and south, the fact that these animals were disappearing because people wanted spotted catskins. And she made it a, a, a social pariah to go to dinner and hand in your, your coat to the, to, the, to the valet as you went in to have your dinner and came out and picked it up. People, I remember very clearly as a young man, watching some of these women who hadn't quite got the message be hissed at, spat at, abused, and it was all a result of that one incident. And so it was in that context that when I took over wildlife and I was given a particular mandate to try and stop the destruction of elephant in Kenya, which was a major economic asset to us because of tourism, thinking that somehow we've got to change the market, which is a pretty daunting concept. And I thought through a number of options and finally decided we would see if we could burn it. And when I first told my wife that I was going to burn the ivory, I think she thought I'd gone completely and utterly mad. And indeed it wasn't very easy to burn ivory in the first instance until we learned the sort of temperatures that are necessary. But we had a very successful, and the shock of that public fire and the publicity it got, which must have gone out to well over a billion people in every country of the world, basically made people aware that killing elephants and them access to, to trinkets and things, and there would be no more elephant if they didn't change their ways. And the illegal price of ivory went down from $150 US a pound to the middleman in Nairobi to five. And it remained there for a long time, not just in Kenya, but in Zambia, in, in West Africa, and it was highly successful. That was a long time ago. And many of the buyers today were people who weren't born then, weren't even at school then, who certainly hadn't, um, haven't any idea of that incident now, it's, it's faded. And the question is, could you do it again? And my answer is, on a national scale, no. But if they somehow were able to get that sort of publicity about the, the plight of this species, perhaps it would help. But it's, it's not easy. But it is education, it is information. And this is why I think some of the documentaries are so important, but they don't always get seen by the right people. So I think education and consumer awareness not just for elephants, but for tuna, uh, for parrots, and for many other things, is, is, is critical. Secondly, I think, and I, I was interested to, to listen to the two presentations, that the numbers of key players in the illegal trade, whether it be ivory or elephant, uh, from elephants, or rhino horn, or parrots, we're not talking about thousands and thousands of key people. You're talking about a relatively small number of people who are buying in and selling on. And there's a lot more we can do, I think, to influence the behavior of a relatively small number of people, particularly in developing countries. And one of the areas that I think we're t looking at now in Kenya is to try and influence not just the public, but to try to have very specific one-on-one -on -one discussions with the men and women who control the destiny of the country at the moment, the Attorney General, the Chief Justice, and ask them to call in their officers and explain that passing the minimum sentence by a magistrate for possession of illegal trophies doesn't help anybody. And I think in the last three months we have seen a turnaround in Kenya where the Chief Justice has directed all magistrates to be a lot more conscious of the economic status of wildlife in terms of Kenya's 
next development strategy. The Attorney General has made it very clear that he is not prepared to hear that stopping a murder is more important than stopping poaching because both affect the future of our country. And I think it's much easier to deal with a few people than a mass. And so I think government education in the developing world is critical. And I don't think I'm seeing very much evidence that's being done around the world. And this, I think, is something we should consider. The third thing that um, I wanted to, to, to draw attention to was that when we started um, the Kenya Wildlife Service, We had the idea that if we put fences around some of the parks, the savanna parks, it would make it a lot easier to control what's going on. And I'm afraid the ecologists and the biologists and a lot of those people had a field day in mocking somebody who may know something about extinct animals but knew nothing about managing and preventing extinction in living animals. Today, the most successful wildlife in terms of long-term outlook in Africa is probably the so Southern African states and South Africa in particular. And you mentioned you were guaranteed the big five. All of them were behind fences. Even if you didn't see the fences, they were all fenced. Some of our least poached now wildlife areas are behind fences. And we've got vast areas. We've got one fence, the Abadez, which is a mountain range. But the fence line, I think, is 980 kilometers up and downhill. And the fence was constructed, started to be constructed while I was there. It's just been completed. Maintenance is a problem. But it's not a fence that simply marks the boundary. It's a fence that's very difficult to go through. Whether you're a porcupine or a school-aged boy up to mischief, whether you want to herd your cattle or come out with illegal timber, it's very hard to penetrate that fence and not be noticed. And we now have in the communities, it's a highly uh, profitable area for agriculture, we have the communities were, which were constantly at war with wildlife and us managers, now using our fence as the fourth side of their corral where they keep their animals cattle and sheep and where they keep their agricultural products safe from things on the other side of the fence like porcupine and, and it's become critical to the communities now that these fences be maintained because when we started it was not seen as, as a particularly nice thing to do to keep them out of these areas but now they're seeing huge benefits from this and I think that's something that in India particularly I've been surprised more hasn't been done and I think many of your isolated tiger reserves, you would reduce the headache of patrol and you'd reduce the headache of cameras photographing people who you're not sure who they are. If you just put a chain link fence, six foot high, set in concrete posts, and with a road running on one side, and you patrol it every day. And if they're, if they're human footprints, you follow them and see where they went. And you'll be surprised how quickly things change. So I think fencing is something that we've got to say to the ecologists and the <coughs> wildlife biologists that we're upsetting the ecosystem. These ecosystems have been upset long before we thought of fences uh, in most cases. Now you obviously wouldn't want to put a fence across the Serengeti with one and a half million. But uh, I think the biologists need to th give some credit to the wildlife protecting groups. We're not all stupid. And we know you can't put a fence across the Serengeti as well as they do. But they, 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 something has to be done. No good continuing to talk, 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 talk. Nothing gets done. Because then you've got your back to the wall. You don't have time to raise the money. And it, it, it would go. The reintroduction of species to territory that is secure is a real possibility in Africa. You can put species back remarkably easily and we know enough now about ecology and, 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 and uh, biomass management that even with climate change I think you can come up with a fair measure of success 
in restoring some of the prime habitat and, and, and ecosystems if you have fencing and if you have proper proof. Now, clearly, some of the smaller parks will need to be much more intensively managed than the big ones. But fencing is a way of crime prevention that I think is very real. Then I was interested to hear that the, the discussion that you made very briefly about um, community participation and community benefits. I don't know the situation in other countries, but in Kenya, the conservationist movement felt that if you're an, an indigenous nomad who has a cow that gets eaten by a lion, well, that's just your choice of lifestyle. And yes, we understand you lost something, but instead of giving you the market value for that animal, we'll give you a contribution towards it. If that animal is your livelihood, and that animal has been clearly taken by an animal you're not supposed to kill, and it's worth 20,000 shillings, and you give somebody four, and say, there, 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 you're still pretty primitive yourself, and don't expect more at this stage. It's not going down very well. People have access to iPhones, people have access to the web, the net, people know what's going on. And although they may not be part of it, um, they're very sensitive to being treated as something somehow different. And I think the, the realistic way, which is difficult, is some of these community conservation projects should actually be developed with some support for commercial activities. They should get some professional help in setting up commercial enterprises around Rogers and things. But the majority shareholding should be with the community and it should be supervised so they can actually get not a contribution from the wildlife, but have wildlife as the mainstay for their community development projects themselves. And I think you'll see a turnaround. We have in Kenya a number of these community reserves now where they invited investors in to build lodges, pay uh, annual rent to pay bed night fees, and these people now get extremely irritated if one of their fellows allows an elephant to be killed. And it no longer requires central government, which is generally an anathema to people of central government interfering in, in a, a newly acquired sense of emancipation and freedom that we have in Kenya with democracy, to have central government interfere. But they will run it themselves perfectly adequately and, and I think the majority of people are looking for a standard of living before worrying about the, the, the sort of soft aspects of wildlife. And so I said I think we've just got to be a little more realistic about the implications of global education, global awareness and not continue to think that if you've been to Rutgers or Cambridge, you somehow have a different value set to the people who've just been through high school or haven't even got to high school. Um, the values can be very similar in terms of where will I be tomorrow and can I live through the next day? And I think we far too many conservation organizations uh, do that. I also think in terms of combating wildlife crime, uh, and dealing with this is, is corruption is critical. Again, corruption comes back to poverty. And if you haven't got money to see your way through your kids next semester at school, it's quite easy to be bought. Um, you have no social security in many developing countries for the peasant level of economic development. And if you can be offered several years' worth of income by turning a blind eye, as the police do. Who wouldn't? Hell, I would. <laughs> if my family was at stake, of course I would. And so I think this is something we need to recognize, and recognize that incentive for integrity, while money is important, it may not be all, but I think the way we treat some of our law enforcement agencies, whether it's the police or the wildlife authority, isn't very good anyway. 
And I think that's a, that's a key, key component of this. And then I think in that same context, I find this huge growth of the NGO movement in the developing world by the indigenous communities, and that's very healthy. Because I think when it's dominated by some of the capitalist countries, it tends to be a sort of a pulpit approach. People down here, and the knowledge and the wisdom and, and sanctity for life is up here. Um, we can, many organizations which I won't name at the moment, but big organizations based in this part of the world, are perfectly prepared for researchers, if they're from this part of the world, to take their vehicles home at night, drop the kids off from school the next morning, go to work, and they're trusted to be using the vehicle they're using basically for the outcome of their work. But if you're a local of a different background, or certainly skin color, and you want to take the vehicle home at night, no, 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 the regulations don't allow that. And this is double standards of the worst kind, which still pertains in the NGO movement across the board. And this idea that if you work for an NGO that's international, you somehow don't get involved in corruption. <laughs> As head of the <coughs> Kenyan Anti-Corruption Transparency International, I recommended that our next major effort of transparency should be look at the religious movements in Kenya for corruption. And I think we're going to get a shock <laughs> that will be quite frightening. They get away with everything because apparently there's a lord that looks after them. They steal everything we have. And I think conservation isn't far behind them in terms of that attitude. So bringing this to a close, I, I think my experiences in Kenya are very, very parochial in a sense. But I think there are common threads running through this. And um, awareness of the, of the consequences of eating bluefin tuna. Awareness of the consequences of buying ivory products, um, tiger products, need, needs to be brought home in, in a very different way to what we're achieving. And I think the majority of human beings, if they know, can almost be relied on to do the right thing, other things being reasonably equal. But if they don't know, how can we really sensibly expect compliance with what is a rather nuanced set of values uh, affecting the planet. And I, I finally uh, would say that um, sometimes you, you reach a stage in your life where you wonder, there seems to be a, a, such an effort to drive the world to a state where life will fail to survive by our inability to recognize the signs. And this climate change issue is going to have a far greater impact on threatened and other species, whether they're terrestrial, marine, or other aquatic, than any poachers ever had at any time. And we cannot seem to get that message across that the um, increased temperatures recently reached 400 parts per million carbon dioxide is going to have huge impact, huge impact. And some of these small national parks, uh, some of these small marine reserves, the movement of pelagic and other fish is going to be a totally different story. And it'll be a totally different story, perhaps not in my lifetime, but in the lifetime of a number of people in this room looking around it. And I think climate change is something we cannot afford to allow the politicians to, to um, pigeonhole as a fad and the press get away with it. Because it is, it is probably, if we're concerned about endangered species, there may be nothing we can do except slow the process. Uh, but we should be doing that too and we should be ensured that even if we can't slow it down, there's enough genetic material, small quantities with enough diversity to one day perhaps have future generations put some of it back. But we can't assume that everything will be fine, because it won't.
Thank you very much.